right, well, Aaron is good to go, so we're going to start a couple minutes early. Woo! Imagine that. So, everybody, this is Erin Kennedy. She's local, right? You're from Ottawa. And she's the founder of Robot Missions. And the work she does is absolutely fascinating. So you want to uh, get those ears queued up and listen to this. So welcome, and thanks for being here. All right. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Hello, everyone. So this talk is more about how you can leverage open source for making an impact in your community. So we'll go through a few tangible examples that we have seen as um, robot missions being a being an open source hardware developer as well as an open source firmware developer. Um, so my name is Erin and with me here is Bowie the robot as well. Um, next slide please. So uh, we have a few different types of Bowie the robots. Uh, here you can see the robots in their natural habitat. Uh, that's really where they belong, on the beaches as opposed to sort of on a table, but here you can see it in real life too. So Bowie the Robot, what Robot Missions is all about is helping the planet using robots. And there we go. And so what we've done is developed this as a low cost open source robot. And it's on a really big mission to clean up plastic pollution that's found on our shorelines. So if you're aware at all of the global pollution challenge, one of the aspects of this problem is all of the plastic bits that get found on shorelines. This has to be cleaned up somehow before it re-enters back into our waterways. So that's where our robot comes in and we're uh, actively developing the autonomous features and the AI features. So a little bit about me. Uh, I guess this would be me in my natural habitat. Um, but really, uh, I primarily learned all of this through open source. So no formal institution per se. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, it was mainly online tutorials, so learning from what other people have uh, taken from open source and then redistributed it, adding their own knowledge to it, as well as community forums and groups. So as you've seen, um, especially with the open source for the government of Canada being on GitHub now, you can actually have active communities on there through the issues and through the wikis and comments and, of course, contributions. Well, earlier than when GitHub was around, there were forums and that's basically where I was able to meet people who also had skilled expertise in um, building electronics and robots and essentially learn from them. And of course, mentors and role models and a lot of generous help uh, is basically how I was able to learn about how to build robots from the ground up. So it just goes to show how open source can really impact and influence one person's life and also even more people's lives. Okay, so... The robot itself is on this audacious goal and with a grand vision to eventually have one robot per park helping with environmental restoration. For example, with picking up trash. And here you can see uh, this is in our model of the robot that picks up <laughs> the debris from the beaches. And this is what we can typically find on a day when uh, it's going around cleaning the beach. So there's cigarette butts, uh, someone's teeth, <laughs> not sure how they lost it, but, um, and of course food wrappers. So why is this important? It's important because it's predicted that there will be more plastic in the oceans than fish by 2050. So we need to clean up some of this. There's many different slices to the problem 
Robot Missions is tackling one of them using open source robotics. So open source robotics is only going to go as far as the people who can help make it, of course. So this here is a photo of the University of Ottawa class where 100 of their engineering students uh, con collaborated together and contributed uh, new designs to the platform uh, under the realm of environmental robotics. So you can think of things like uh, seed dispensers to help plant more grass seed, uh, as well as uh, soil moisture probes to understand where water could be deposited more efficiently than, say, watering an entire lawn. So why does open source matter for this? Why would we take something that uh, should be uh, just closed source so that way it could be potentially even more commercially viable? Well, it matters for this because we need the solution out there. We need this solution everywhere in all parks to be able to help because one of the ways where we would be able to tackle the global pollution challenge is by doing it in our own local communities. So our idea is that we would use distributed manufacturing using hundreds of fab labs that are located globally around the world. So if you look uh, at the top there, you can see a map and that's where all of these fab labs are located. And in a fab lab, you have all of the digital uh, tools available to be able to rapidly prototype a robot such as this one, which is primarily 3D printed. And of course, along with the 100 students uh, contributing their new ideas to it, we're, we get even more new ideas when we're actually bringing it out into the community and seeing how well the robot does and involving them in the testing process. So that's why open source really matters for this, because we want to be able to harness the ability of many people being able to contribute and also replicate the robot in their own community. So this is super cool, right? We're going to have a robot that gets replicated using 3D printers all around the world to help pick up trash, to help do data logging, and even more possibilities. But uh, so where exactly would we start with this big idea? And uh, how exactly can we harness open source to make this happen? So the first step is to build on the shoulders of giants. We don't need to reinvent what's already out there because we can just use it to be able to go even faster. And there are a lot of cool tools out there nowadays that really help this. So this just gives a look at some of what we build the robot on top of. So, uh, for example, Arduino, that's uh, used as the development environment for this uh, microcontroller that we use uh, called the Teensy. We also use a Raspberry Pi for some of the advanced uh, navigation or artificial intelligence that we're uh, completing with the robot. And then, of course, on the Raspberry Pi, we're running TensorFlow and processing to be able to do the AI and vision work. And of course, uh, the robot's entirely 3D printed, and the rise or the democratization of 3D printers is all based off of the open source start of it. And if you can imagine, before uh, TensorFlow became well known, it was a lot, a lot more difficult to add AI to almost anything. Now there's a lot more tutorials, a lot more knowledge out there, and of course the whole package, which makes it so fast to get up and running. So standing on the shoulders of giants, all the people who went into making these building blocks can make th this possible. So, next 
Step number two is to tell everyone and anyone about it endlessly. Sort of like the environment we've been in here today where everyone's really excited about open source. So it's like talking about open source to people who may not have already been aware of it. You have to do this endlessly so that way they can uh, start to understand it and see the uh, possibilities. So for example, one thing that we did with robot missions was to reach out to local groups who could help raise the awareness of the project. For example, Ottawa Civic Tech gave a presentation there and then all of a sudden we have a group of like-minded individuals who can help raise uh, the awareness of the project again and um, help us get even more resources to make this vision a uh, step towards reality. Uh, finding people in your local government is also really key if you want to try to make a real difference in your community using open source, whatever your vision is. So uh, here we see uh, myself with Councillor Jeff Leeper, who is uh, really instrumental in helping push this project forward so that way we could actually bring robots onto the beach, which is really cool. And then, of course, word of mouth, just spreading the message with ordinary people through social media or through uh, regular media, like uh, paper stuff, newspapers. Yeah, um, people still read newspapers. And then they come out to our events because they hear about it. Step number three is to involve people in the process. Now, this part can be a little daunting because you have to really be um, open to the fact that your idea or your product may not be completely finished yet, that it's in this sort of state where it can be morphed in many different directions and it's definitely not perfect at this point in time. So what that looked like for our project to be able to make a community impact was to invite everyone to our field tests. This would mean that sometimes the robot wouldn't work perfectly and people would be confused because the general stereotype of robots is that they work flawlessly. Not exactly true in reality. But what's exciting about this is that when we're talking about trying to harness open source and also uh, educating the public, this is how it's done by showing people that the process is malleable and that what we learn from testing and what we learn from involving people in the process goes back into making the project even better for the next time. And so uh, there's a little story about this uh, young kid who would always visit us uh, at our installation on the beach. So this is Ben. He's obviously a robot builder in training. I mean, he has his tools with him already, and the robot's there. He would visit the beach every single day and come by to see how the robots were doing, what they were doing differently today, what changed from uh, last time to this time, and um, ideas about how it could do it even better for the next day. Now, if you think about this, this young kid is seeing robots on the beaches collecting pollution, and this is now commonplace to Ben. He doesn't know of a beach now without robots on it collecting garbage. So in a way, it's just the rest of us who are behind. And Ben is just clearly uh, on cue with uh, helping the environment uh, restore itself. Uh, so with open source, now you can see how it's been having ripples. We've been... Uh, doing the testing on the beach using this robot that's been built off of open source. And now this 
young kid will be able to see how um, it can evolve even further. So to sum it all up, it's all about becoming a superhero, really. So open source lets you take on audacious goals, whether you're building your own startup or whether you're in the government. Now that you can see how there's ways to harness open source to make an impact in your community, just feel free to try to take on these really big ideas and really big audacious goals because it is possible. You'll have a group of people there to help you out as long as there's ways that they know they can contribute and see it grow even further. And of course, as we're being superheroes working on open source, it lets us tackle the audacious goals together. And that's really the important part, that we're doing it together so that way we all see a resulting product or project that encompasses a lot more opinions and goes the route that would be better for the sake of the project rather than the sake of um, uh, whoever would be governing it, let's say. So open source, uh, harnessing open source to be able to achieve these audacious goals, it's possible just as long as it's uh, being done together. And of course, this isn't really the end. It's just a continuing point to keep going onwards. Uh, and at this point, if you would have any questions or actually want to learn more about um, open source hardware and that, how that differs from open source software or firmware, we're then happy to answer any questions that you have at this time. Okay. I'll ask a question. Oh, you have a question? Uh, well, it depends how many you produce, right? So um, just one, it would be less than um, about like $2,000, but it's much less than that depending on like how many mistakes you make or <laughs> how many parts you blow up. Can you just share with everybody um, maybe like a best practice when you talk about community and engagement and get, getting everyone like, you know, off their chairs and involved? Um, give us like a best takeaway or I think in government that's a big struggle is getting that involvement and getting that engagement because I don't think it's always done properly. So do you have any uh, tips and tricks you want to share? <laughs> yeah, sure. So best practices for getting people involved would be to have an in-person gathering. That way everyone can uh, resonate off of everyone else's energies. And for that in-person gathering, make sure to try to organize it a few weeks in advance. That way you can do a lot of advertising beforehand. Uh, that way people know to actually block it off in their calendars. Um, uh, another thing in terms of best practices is um, before you release something as a platform that you would want other people to build on, make sure it's documented well because it's possible that there may be an inrush of people wanting to uh, use what you've built to uh, make their own project and you may not have the capacity at that time to handle that many inquiries about questions or documentation or anything. So um, documentation is really key and it would have to be written from the point of view of someone who hasn't been in the project but is eager to learn more. Those are the two main best practices. 
I'm just curious, um, what you have planned next for like for next summer or like future iterations of the robots? What's sort of next on the roadmap? Um, it's hard to say at this current moment, but uh, what we were planning next was a citywide expansion of the effort. So that way we would have these uh, hubs on a few parks in the city that would serve as citizen science hubs. So robot missions could be one of the things in the citizen science hub, or you could have even uh, other ones such as um, water quality monitoring in some of them. Um, we would also envision having uh, a few of the robots do different tasks more reliably so that way people could just pick up the controller and it would just do the job because uh, we've now luckily reached the point where it's getting even more reliable in terms of the navigation and the artificial intelligence. And. The other like, really crazy idea is uh, we want to see if uh, five groups around the world would want to replicate the robot. So thinking of doing a way to send out a kit to them with the electronics inside, and then they would print all of the pieces, assemble it, do a field test in their own community, and then report back. That way we would now have five Bowies in the world that would be elsewhere than Canada. So expanding globally should be pretty cool. So I think this is super cool and I want my eight year old to do it. So I want to invest in a camp where he can go and build this robot in the summer. Um, so what experience level do you really need to do to, to do one of these? So if you were going to send the kit somewhere in the world, what would the, the, the person receiving it need to know or be able to figure out? Uh, yeah, that's a good question. It would mainly be a uh, group of people that would be receiving the kit. So you would need members with um, an interest in electronics, an interest in programming, interest in fabrication, and an interest in uh, mechanical uh, side of things. So the skill level for those interests, they could be starting at pretty well beginner, but you have to be willing to take on a somewhat steep learning curve. Um, but it's not as steep as being impossible, so it is doable. And of course, it's obviously proven that someone's uh, been able, or groups of people have been able to do it before. But the key is to really choose an area that you're focused in for the robot and then work on exploring that. Uh, so for example, um, a good place to start for the firmware person would be to have done a few Arduino projects already where you are doing code that's typed in the IDE. So for example, not using a GUI programmer like Scratch, uh, it would be actually typed in. Um, and in terms of, say, fabrication, having done a few 3D prints already and tuned in your printer so it doesn't fail every time, uh, that would be a really good starting point. And then what's really cool is that by the end of it, the person on that sub-team may not even end up being interested in that sub-team anymore. Because it's a robot, you can like jump to different systems. So uh, all of a sudden, you may be learning electronics, too. Any more questions? <laughs> All right. Uh, oh gosh. All right. So uh, Ashley is um, pushing me to mention this one sort of uh, road bump in the robot missions journey. Uh, so o over the weekend, last weekend, we had an unfortunate incident on the beach where the station that you saw in many of the photos, the purple station, uh, has unfortunately now burned down. We had some stuff inside. Some of it was rescued, but now the station is no longer. Uh, so the part that I was mentioning about how it's important the open source community works together 
is really key here because on GoFundMe, we've raised uh, $3,000 towards um, the uh, damages that have happened. So um, together we can get over this road bump, hopefully, uh, without too much trouble and yeah, it really just goes to show that part's important. It can really make a big difference when you at least expect it. Erin, I love how humble you are. It's amazing. But you guys, you need one of the things, and Elizabeth mentioned this in her question, she wanted to invest. This is, Erin's done a Kickstarter campaign, which was unsuccessful because I think that we as a community haven't figured out how we promote these things adequately um, and how we provide and demonstrate these types of opportunities. And it was also mentioned earlier, um, I think by Liv on the panel, is that we aren't um, selling ourselves enough with all of the things that we're doing. Erin's a perfect example of this. I can't, like every single time she talks about these things, it blows my mind how much she's been able to accomplish. She uses the word we, but it's really been her that's been doing a lot of these things. Um, so not only kudos to that, but I think that it's really, really important that when these bumps in the road, as you so eloquently put it, happen, that we do kind of coalesce together. So she has a GoFundMe page, we'll tweet it out, um, and you can send the link there. And while, yes, there's, there's $3,000, there could be more costs that are incurred as a result of that. So even if we can all contribute a little bit or spend, whether it's monetary or otherwise, our volunteer time to, to help kind of uh, robot missions with the work that they're doing, um, you can see how if this is a repeatable process, not only across the world, but here in Ottawa, there's a lot of gains that can be made. So that's stronger, Erin. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> You're like, yeah, it's collaborative. <laughs> go, go fund her. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much, Aaron, for being here and sharing your story. Uh, it was really great. I think open source is like, um, it's, it's proof that, that when people get together, you know, people will really support what they help create. So the more we can involve people, the better the